This weekend, our nation celebrates the anniversary of our independence from the British Empire. That independence, and I'm not just talking about the specific occasion of declaring our national sovereignty, but the very ideal of being able to stand on our own without the help or oversight of anyone else, is very dear to us. Independence is in our blood. We call ourselves the land of the free. We take it a duty to export and share that freedom across the globe. We adore our freedom. It's what makes us who we are. And to our credit, the great American experiment has given birth to greater freedoms and liberties in many parts of the world over the last two centuries, as foreign countries and peoples have realized the value and the power of such freedom. However, on this holiday celebrating the freedom that makes us who we are, it's worth remembering that freedom in itself has a dark side. Because to be free, to be truly and completely free, necessarily means having the freedom to destroy ourselves. Unfortunately, at this moment in history, it's all too easy to come up with examples of this kind of dark freedom. As we exercise our right to personal autonomy, resisting the orders from governors and the pleas of healthcare workers to stay at home or to wear masks when we go into public, our national rate of infection and the COVID death toll has continued to rise at an alarming rate, a rate higher than any other developed nation. We are free to destroy ourselves. 150 years ago, our nation went to war with itself over the freedom for states to decide for themselves whether or not to own other human beings and hold them in slavery. Racism is the lasting legacy of that freedom to which we so tightly held, a legacy that is even now plucking at the seams of our national peace and unity. We are free to destroy ourselves. As climates change, as weather patterns shift and ice caps melt, as species go extinct due to the loss of their habitats, we are free to debate whether or not there is even a problem. We could curb our consumption. We could choose to invest in industry or energy that will leave a lighter mark on the world. But we are too content with our personal cars and our on-demand lifestyle. We would rather have the freedom to live the lives we want to live for the time we have left than to give up some of that freedom and buy ourselves more time. We are free to destroy ourselves. I could go on, but you get the picture. From the very opening verses of Genesis, Scripture tells the story of God giving humankind the most precious gift there is, free will, and of humanity immediately using that gift to set ourselves over and against God. Having the freedom to make our own choices and decisions means having the freedom to make the wrong ones. It is our election for making these poor choices that haunts us. It seems to entrap us in a downward spiral of destruction and despair. This predilection destruction is what Paul calls sin. This sin enslaves us, he says. We may think that we are free, but we are not free at all. We are no more free than the gambler in the casino who is always just one hand away from winning it all. We may think that we are in control, but the truth is the house always wins. Even as we think we are exercising our freedom, we find so often that we are slaves to our own passions. In Romans, Paul describes his own struggle with sin. But we know from Paul's letter to the Philippians that he actually doesn't struggle that hard. He calls himself blameless according to the law. Clearly, he didn't think that obedience to the law was beyond him. Israel, on the other hand, Israel had been given God's law by Moses. And though they delighted in the law, they failed to keep it. Paul here places himself in the place of Israel. He becomes an example of his fellow Israelites. 
Perhaps some people, like him, could keep the law. But the nation as a whole found that the law itself was insufficient to make them righteous. And even the people like Paul, who kept the law their entire lives, sometimes woke up to find their zeal for God's law was itself what caused them to sin against God by becoming self-righteous and even persecuting and killing other human beings in God's name. It is this realization that prompts Paul to cry out, Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin? I think that this letter to the Romans is so compelling because we also experience that same conundrum in our own lives. Like Israel, the United States is a nation that delights in the law, but ours is a law of freedom. And yet our national devotion to freedom, our delight in freedom, has not made us more free. It has resulted in slavery, in rampant consumerism, in crushing indebtedness, and in crippling poverty. In our national declaration of independence, we proclaim that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And yet this is clearly not self-evident. At the time of that writing, black men were only considered to be three-fifths equal to a white man, and that's to say nothing of the relative worth of women to men. Two hundred years later, the self-evidence of this claim is still dubious at best. As we continue to debate the relative worth of people who are homosexual or transgendered, people who come from, pardon the phrase, shithole countries, or do not have homes to live in, or who don't look like they belong in our neighborhoods. If this is the legacy of a country founded on the principle of freedom, then where can our hope lie? Who will save us from this body of death? Paul goes to great pains in his letter to the Romans to make the point that the law is not a problem. The law comes from God and is holy, just, and good. Neither is the problem Israel. Their inability to keep God's law is not due to their special infidelity or some ethnic lack of morality. Rather, Paul says, the problem that Israel has is the same problem that all humanity has. The same problem that America has. Our problem is sin. That answerable pull that we have to our own destruction. With Paul, we might well cry out, who save us from this body of sin? And there is a long line of politicians and holy men and snake oilsmen ready to sell us that answer. People making the claim that I alone can fix this. But I guarantee you they are all wrong. There is no one person, no one solution, no one legislation or political sum or philosophy that can save us from ourselves. There is no silver bullet, no magical technological breakthrough that will make everything better, no leader who will finally give us everything we need. Even if there were, I suspect that we would be too unwilling to give up our freedom to accept it. In last weeks we've read about Jesus sending out the twelve apostles, telling them to proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. He gave them the power to cure disease and cleanse lepers and even to raise the dead. Equipped with that message and that power, they went out and they returned as failures. In the section of our gospel reading that was omitted this morning, Jesus rebukes the Galilean towns of Bethsaida and Chorazin and even Capernaum, Jesus' own adopted home, for their rejection of his message. But as soon as he finishes doing that, he turns and gives thanks to God. He says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and revealed them to infants. 
Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. It's not the wise or the intelligent who have this all figured out. The powerful are not the ones who can save us from mess we're in. It's the vulnerable, the unpretentious, the naive who have seen the truth. These infants understand what the intelligent and the wise and the powerful do not, because they are under no illusions that they can save themselves. To these beat up, bedraggled, and burnt out people, Jesus makes an invitation. Come to me, you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come to me, you who are carrying the burdens of pandemic and racism and climate change, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. A yoke, as you may know, is a harness, white animals, which allows them to pull wagons or plows. The promise Jesus makes here is not to remove our burdens, but to replace them with his own. You see, being free means having the ability to choose our own destruction. It also means having the ability not to. Although the wise and the intelligent may think that they have it all figured out, refusing any help from the infants of the world, the naive and the foolish may be ready to roll up their sleeves and slip into the yoke alongside Jesus because we recognize that he is here. Taking his yoke upon ourselves is not giving up freedom. It's about using our freedom in a way that's beneficial not just to ourselves, but to God's whole world. We can choose to wear masks. We can choose to buy less. We can choose to help our neighbors in need. We can choose to vote against our party or become active in anti-racism work or pack food backpacks for kids. On this holiday celebrating freedom, perhaps it is good for us to remember that freedom is not just about what we are freed from, but what we are freed for. We celebrate not because we were freed from colonial rule, but because that freedom allows us to work to make this world and ourselves better. And we have a long way to go in that regard, both as Americans and as Christians. But that is why Jesus invites us to take up his yoke, to slip into that harness beside him. There is no silver bullet, no one simple thing that we can say or do or pray to make all of our problems go away. If we're going to address these issues, it has to be over the long haul. Which is why Jesus invites us to take our place beside him, to pull this yoke alongside him, to learn from him, however long that may take. Because as we yoke up beside Jesus, we learn from him over the long haul, as we work together to announce the coming of God's kingdom.